again. Now at this time I'd like to encourage you to look at the music of the past in order to get ideas for your own composition. We've been doing this all the time, but now I want to show you actually how some other composers have been doing this. First of all, let's just remind ourselves what we did with this... This rather sad shepherd of Schubert's. Okay, but it was only a small song. He's only a small shepherd, and so it's not really a big deal. What a difference it was when we added three-part polyphony, used the voices, and then we suddenly had this enormous bombastic machine. It reminded us a bit of perhaps these uh, 19th century Gothic revival cathedrals. Um, there's something perhaps not quite right about that, but it's still, as an exercise, extremely valuable. And of course has the advantage that you don't have to drive past it every day. Now the person we're going to have to look at very closely is Richard Wagner, because he discovered a way of using chromatic harmony in a much more explosive way to avoid the heaviness of this bombastic Gothic cathedral and to somehow keep taking the ground away from under our feet. Let's see how he does this. This is the prelude to Tristan, the first three notes. Okay, now if I just have that and ask myself, what is the tonality? So assuming that the first note could be actually our keynote, well, we have a fifth there, plus this little thing that looks like it could be an appoggiatura or something going into this. So, if we have the fifth, well, that would define our tonality as A major or minor, and this little note defines it as minor. Well, that would suggest it would be A major. So, without actually saying A minor, already in these first three notes, I already have a little, more than a strong inkling that this could be A minor. Of course, this is completely thrown off course by the second bar. I get this chord. Now, people have tried giving this names, and of course, they ended up just calling it the Tristan chord. It's become very famous just in its own right. Um, it's famous, actually, it's only, if we look at it closely, it is only a chord of F, diminished with a minor seventh, well that makes it a half diminished chord. You know? This is something that Bach or Schubert certainly would have been quite happy in using, so there's nothing new about the chord. What's new is putting it st straight after what we thought was going to be A minor, because this can either go to G flat major or to E flat minor. Well, even by Schubert's standards, we're an awfully long way away from A minor. So, let's just see how Wagner solves it. Because he doesn't go either of those directions, but he takes this up and... comes to an E7 chord. Now, we spent some time just seeing how much or how little information do I really need in order to define a tonality. I had an inkling of... A minor at the beginning, I end my first phrase on E7. But if it hadn't been for this thing sticking out like a sore thumb in the middle, I would be quite happy with a tonality of A minor, but I'm, because of this still sitting there, I really am not quite sure what's going on. So the second phrase, again a sort of Tristan chord, and ending with G7. As you know, E7 would have been A minor, possibly A major, but I mean an A is sort of tonality. The second one is G7, well that's a sort of C tonality. And then the third phrase, again the same sort of thing, ending on an B7. So that would be a tonality of E major or minor. Of course, if the composer had started his composition with A, C, E, we would all have been in no doubt whatsoever what the tonality was. He's done exactly that, but it takes at least a Sherlock Holmes to work out exactly how he's got there, because he's 
hidden his tracks absolutely at every, every moment. Now let's carry on from here and we get... He repeats. And just leaves the tension there. Of course, this all goes much slower. It's agonizing in the theater, waiting for all this to happen. Okay, we just don't know where this is gonna go. And we finally get... Well, that with its appoggiatura is an E9. Or it could be either of those, but it looks like an A sort of tonality. We'd all have been perfectly happy, we'd have said, thank you, Richard, we know exactly where we are, and it's a perfectly normal introduction to a classical symphony, perhaps. But now, he just disappoints us once again, and we get a, uh, what the Germans call a Trugschluss, an interrupted cadence. It's one of the biggest ones in the repertoire. It, is... it would be bad enough if it just did that. But to add to the agony, Wagner gives us an absolutely endless appoggiatura onto this note. Well, the story of Tristan des Olde is about the lovers who will never, never come together, not in this life. They almost come together, but they don't quite make it. Tragedy absolutely pure. And we go on from here. After this agonized moment, well, that's D7, that's fairly natural. Also D7. And then the seventh chords, without their resolution, follow thick and fast, chromatically on one another. The ground is constantly taken away from underneath our feet. And we're left feeling, actually, if either high or else extremely disturbed. Now, with Parsifal, we have a different ball game. We have a, a ninth chord of E flat. And we add the pedal note to A flat, which is where we're going to go away from. Okay, here, look at this. indulgence in harmony for its sensuality and of course it was very shocking for some people but somebody who looked at this and never looked back was of course Claude Debussy. Now if we just take the opening of Debussy's Fête Galante we have this well this is not a secret that's just the Tristan chord, one octave higher. And he even gives us that as the moment the, the singer starts as well. Debussy was hooked on this chord, this Tristan chord, and he seemed to have spent his whole life looking for other ways of coming out of it. Um, another way he does it is, of course, this little doodle. You can just imagine him messing around at the piano, as indeed I'm sure Wagner didn't just hit all this by accident. It was probably the result of some doodling. So we'll look at this. Well, that's the Tristan chord. And that's the opening signal of La Mer. Again, he ends with this chord, which is, if we like, a transposition of... It could easily be the Tristan chord there as well. That's one of the variations that Wagner didn't take. Uh, and a last example of Debussy, of course, doing this with the après midi. Again, we have this chord, which is an inversion, if we like, of the Tristan chord once again. 
I'm going to be talking about Debussy and the Prelude in a separate talk. So that's going to be all for today.